We're here at the Nanopore community meeting in New York and we're joined by Cecil Yule and Owen Harrington who've just done a wonderful double plenary session for us. Now, Nanopore is best known for its longer reads, but as we all know, a Nanopore will process whatever length of DNA or RNA that it is given. And in fact, there are a lot of emerging applications using Nanopore for shorter read lengths in, in um, certain applications. So, Cecil, how did you describe that work today? Yeah, I, I showed two examples of using shorter reads, or short, ultra short reads actually. Um, so it really it matters on what you're trying to do. So the unique thing about nanopores is that you can sequence long things or short things or medium things or whatever your, whatever your sample is. And some samples just naturally come short, like ancient DNA or sulfur DNA, and I tried to sort of show what samples that might be. And I showed two of the things today. So one was sulfur DNA, which is inherently very short, and the other was an implicon panel, which is also short. Um, implicons are usually quite short. So we use them to for SNP calling. That's really the major thing that we've been doing. Um, and really, the unique thing about nanopores is that we don't lose any sort of throughput on shorter reads versus long reads, whereas other technologies would lose throughput, you can't scale because um, you, you don't have that many channels to use. And, but because nanopores just keep taking on new molecules, we actually also quite uniquely sequence short things, um, for, at least for scalability. So that was my two sort of two applications today, was to show how short reads work. And then we couldn't help but have a long read application as well, because that's what we've been known for so long. And how about the long read application? What, what did you talk about in your talk today? So that was Owen. Yeah, so uh, I talked about PORC, uh, which is a comet and confirmation capture method that we've uh, kind of been developing over the last few years. Uh, and, you know, kind of the last few months, we've made a lot of progress in throughput, uh, reliability, al analytics. And we now have a preprint that came out just a month ago that's seen a lot of interest, and we're very excited about that. What I presented today was some kind of new results that we've had that show that you can use these PORC reads to phase SNPs across very long distances. And not only that, you can also um, phase uh, DNA modification. So you kind of get both allelic variation and epiallelic variation within this very data-rich PORC read. And what kind of samples have you been working with initially for PORC and where does that go next? So we've started with um, cell, uh, cell lines because that's kind of what the standard samples are. If you want to do any comparisons to existing data, that's what you start with. We're kind of now hoping to move into primary tissues, other organisms, so Drosophila, plants, things like that. And you know, we might start looking at you know lower inputs and, and things like that. So it's it's kind of an exciting time. Fantastic. You've had a few thousand downloads already of the paper, haven't you? So yeah. you must have been receiving a lot of interest from the community. What are the questions that you're most commonly getting from the community about Borsi? I mean, I think a lot of people uh, are interested in the analysis just because it's so different from what went before. Like, how do you kind of handle all of this multi-contact information and you know, keep, keep that without throwing it away and just becoming these pairwise contacts. So that's kind of the main thing we're hearing. But people, I think, are just very excited to use it you know, for assembly, for structural variation. There's just so many potential applications. So I, the next few months, I think we'll prove that out a little bit. And it's going be a good time. Fantastic. Now, right at the end of the talk, we ran out of time, but someone um, asked a question that Cecil insisted on answering. <laughs> and that was people asking about accuracy of short reads versus long reads when using yeah. nanopore. So, I think we, we can admit at this point that a long time ago we did have lower accuracy on short reads or at the beginning of a read really and we just don't have that anymore after we've updated like base calling specifically and the, the nanopore always had the say, had the right accuracy this is how we interpret that data and after we've had several updates of our base calling we actually have the same accuracy across the whole read so the accuracy on short reads is exactly the same as the accuracy on longer reads um, but what we did what we did what I did what I did talk about was using UMIs and so they kind of have a dual purpose so one is to um, to get rid of PCR bias because you everything that has the same UMI came from the same parent molecule, so if there is a, um, if there is some sort of duplication, which there is with amplification, then you can you can collapse that into clusters with the UMIs. But more importantly, or as important, is that you can get rid of PCR um, errors and sequencing errors with these UMIs. So you cluster things together and you can polish the reads in the same cluster, and you get really high accuracy single molecule reads. Fantastic. And what are the potential applications for that? With anything. I mean, UMIs, are, if you look at competing technologies, they're used for everything. I mean, there's a lot of use of them in cDNA, in counting, and, C and cDNA can also be really short if you just only sequence the first few bases of it. So if you add a UMI to that, you, c you really get into like high, high, high throughput. Um, out of methane, you can get millions of, of reads now, and you can use UMIs to cluster things and, and to count. So there's many applications. Fantastic. It's really exciting time. Please do watch the talk on uh, the Nanopore Research Centres and keep tuned for the Nanopore Community Meeting.